much for coming. Um, we have Metni here today to lead a design uh, workshop on prototyping. Um, she was here with us last semester and she talked about her journey in UX design. So we're super excited to have her here again. Metni, if you'd like to start by introducing yourself. Yeah, for sure. Thank you guys so much for having me again. Um, my name's Metni. Um, for those of you who um, I didn't talk to you last time, um, I'm currently in my final year in my master's program, um, studying information science, specializing UX design. Um, I'm going to be working at SoFi full time starting in July, so I'm really excited about that. And I graduated from Rice in 2019 as um, an Archie. Um, I was in SID, so if anyone hears from SID, then yay, go SID. Um, but yeah, so that's pretty much about me. And I'll be talking to you guys a little bit about the kind of prototyping process in UX design um, and how that kind of ties into a little bit of the development cycle um, and what prototyping is. So it's a pretty broad process um, and there are a bunch of steps um, in prototyping as a whole. So it can be a little bit overwhelming um, and it's very much up to you as a designer to kind of decide when to use each step. So I'm not really here to prescribe like, this is exactly what you should be doing step by step, but rather kind of giving you an overview of like the idea of the tools that we have and like what you can use and kind of leave it up to you to formulate that process for yourself based on what you think works. Um, so I'm gonna start off by breaking down the kind of different types of prototypes that exist and are out there, how they kind of differ from one another, um, when or why you wanna use them, and then kind of go into talking about the prototyping methodologies that you'll probably experience and how a typical process could look like. Um, so I'm going to start talking about the levels of fidelity of different prototypes. So this is pretty um, important. It's kind of like the foundation of understanding um, the different types, and that'll be more obvious later. Um, but essentially, I'm trying to explain um, kind of how detailed a content, uh, sorry, a design is or what how much content to include uh, when you're talking about levels of fidelity. Um, a prototype can come in a lot of different forms, um, and this is kind of the most basic way of breaking them down into different types. Um, and ob like as indicated by the little gradient that you see, this isn't really that discrete of a process. Um, a lot of the times I'll find myself kind of working in between low or medium or medium and high. Um, so it's really up to you to decide like what's most productive to show um, or what not to show um, in order for you to be able to articulate your idea and like get the kind of feedback that you want. So low fidelity prototypes are generally the kind of bare bones of an idea. And it's like where you as a designer are trying to figure out and kind of play with, play around with initial ideas. Um, so you're kind of trying to get an idea of where things are gonna be placed, um, the rough kind of information architecture of a page or multiple pages, um, and also kind of used when you're trying to get um, more high level feedback from your peers or stakeholders on initial ideas and concepts mainly just to kind of see if the direction that you're going in is feasible or like helpful to users. Um, on a medium fidelity level, there's a little bit more going on here. So you can include placeholder text um, or images, um, but it's by no means the final product. So how much information that is like close to the final prototype you decide to include is pretty much up to you, um, but whatever kind of suits your needs best. Um, at this point, you kind of have an idea of how to display the information, you know, like what the goal of the product is, but you're playing with the arrangement of the elements and how like different um, layouts could look pretty much. Um, I would say the majority of the time as a designer, you'll probably be spending in medium fidelity. Um, and this is where you kind of can iterate on ideas, really get into the weeds of like, how might this button look or how might like this field be placed. Um, and it's a great place to get detail, I mean, detailed feedback on like button placement or understand if like the patterns that you're using for your design are familiar to users. This is also kind of where you would start to create a design system um, to kind of make a more consistent um, style for your app as a whole or interface. Um, so for example, getting that like unified button um, and field look overall for the entire interface. Um, and if Someone, if you guys don't know what a design system is, feel free to ask at the end of the presentation as well. Um, and so for high fidelity, um, it's pretty much as close to the end product as it gets. You wanna have like all your text and images filled in, no more placeholders here. It should be a polished kind of complete representation of the product. 
Um, here, all the color and typefaces should be consistent across all the screens. So there shouldn't be kind of like a different styles um, across the same flow. And it's really helpful presenting your finalized product and ideas and get feedback from stakeholders and users um, before the real product gets launched. This is also where you kind of hand off um, to developers and it helps them see exactly what they're gonna be building um, and kind of give them like a, I guess, instructional manual on like what exactly they're building, like what are the pixel sizes and what's the like spacing between elements um, might also include like specifications on exactly the dimensions of certain elements and stuff like that. <clears throat> Um, so the next part type of prototype, I guess I'll be talking about is kind of the different ways you'll hear people refer to de designs and screens. Um, keep in mind that all of these are used in the prototyping process and the terms are sometimes used like interchangeably, um, but there are clear distinctions as to what um, each entails. So it can get a little confusing just because they are all part of the prototyping process, even though like the word prototype refers to a specific type of representation. Um, but I'll provide like some examples and images um, of these different types in the coming slides as well. So wireframes are typically the lowest fidelity of all three of these. Um, they're very simple, bare bones. Um, it's pretty much just like low fidelity designs. You're trying to get elements into place. You don't really need text or content. It can just be a very graphic or visual representation of like what a screen would look like. Um, it's really there to help you get that bigger picture. You can plan out the flow of a product and understand kind of how screens link together with this as well. So that's a really helpful way of visualizing like, okay, what comes after this sign up screen? Like, how does this onboarding flow work? Or like, how does this payment flow work? Um, you really are trying to use this to figure out how a screen can be structured and start thinking about like where to put elements, where to separate to a new screen. Um, and the best tools that I would recommend using this are ones where you can really keep it simple and not go overly into the weeds. So um, at this point, you're trying to stay high level and just flush out as many ideas as you can. So I would recommend for this um, either sketching by hand, if that's something you're comfortable with. Balsamic is a really good tool where they have like the preset elements. So like text boxes or like image frames um, that you can just like plop in there, but it's very like low fidelity. It doesn't look polished at all. So people are able to like get past that um, barrier of like, oh, why is that color so weird? Or like, why is that slightly off-centered or something like that to really evaluate the idea as a whole. Um, Figma and Sketch also work for this. If you have like elements from previous projects that are like simplified down, um, I can show you and uh, I'll have an example coming up where I actually use Figma and Sketch to work on this as well. For mockups, um, this is where the line kind of gets a little bit blurry between medium and high fidelity. Um, so as you know, like I was saying before, this is kind of like a spectrum. Um, so it's not really discrete elements, but mockups can really range from black and white screens um, to with like a little bit of content to a pretty much fully fleshed out idea. Um, so this kind of represents what a screen will look like um, at the very least, the placement of elements is like pretty much finalized at this point. And this is where you can kind of start to experiment with UI elements like color or typography and really try out different styles and palettes. Um, the mockups are generally used to make decisions about like the overall look and feel of a product um, where you're kind of comparing different versions and like iterating on your designs and seeing what users think about um, your different versions. Um, this might be where you can kind of focus on like what type of button you want to use for saving, whether it's like a text button or like a image or icon. Um, generally, you will probably use Figma and Sketch or Adobe XD for this, whatever you you feel comfortable with doing the bulk of your design work visually in. And then finally, prototypes. These are generally high fidelity. I would say like 80% of the time they're high fidelity finished designs, but sometimes they can be medium or medium to low fidelity if you're trying to test some initial concepts of users that need to be clickable. Um, the main concept here is that users can interact with the design and it's a working model of the product that you're gonna be launching. Um, the important part of a prototype is that users are able to experience it and click through it. So you can conduct user tests and evaluate the usability. Um, at a high level, um, it can be really useful I mean, sorry, at the hi-fi level, it can be super useful to show like um, devs how a specific interaction should be coded or like what sorts of animations to use. And then finally, I would say Figma, Adobe XD and InVision are great for like um, the typical interactions and like 
kind of bringing a prototype to life. Um, they all have really robust tools for clickable prototypes, but if you're trying to go into like really like funky animating animations or like trying to really get like detailed interactions, I would recommend something like After Effects or Principle or Framer um, for more advanced stuff. But I would say for the most part, you would probably be sticking to Figma, Adobe XD, Envision, unless you're like specializing in animation. Um, so here are some examples of wireframes that I've done. So as you can see, they kind of range from different levels of fidelity. So the first one is very lo-fi, very like hand sketch, pretty much just like my first round of iterations. Um, that is considered a wireframe. Um, and then there's kind of a more like in between medium and lo-fi one where you have a little bit of text and you're like, I'm just trying to figure out like where stuff wants to go. Um, but again, it's very like bare bones and just like the skeleton, no need to like think about colors. And then finally, this one is kind of like a cross between the two where you kind of like see the elements and stuff and it's a little more polished than like what the sketch is, but it's pretty much the same idea. So these two were made in um, sketch and I pretty much just like created these little blocks and like I've been reusing them over and over again. Um, but Balsamic is a really great tool if you're like, oh, I don't wanna deal with all of that, but I also don't wanna make a sketch that's like kind of messy if I'm not good at hand drawing. So yeah, I started working on these because I feel like my hand drawings are very messy sometimes um, and it's better for me to articulate my ideas this way. And so here are some versions of like hi-fi mockups that I've done. Um, so most of these are like, these are all high fidelity obviously, but mockups can also be black and white and like not fully fleshed out in terms of the graphics yet, depending on what the purpose of the mockup is. Um, so it could be somewhere between here and what the last slide was showing. Um, so I guess this is kind of a mockup that I made for SoFi when I was working over the summer, um, showing the kind of like investment um, tear sheet. And then this is an app that I worked on for school. It's like a, Trap, sort of like a finding activities near you and like fun things to do to plan with friends. And then this one is like a Google design challenge that I worked on that's actually a campus repair app for Rice. So that was fun to do. Um, cool. And as you can see, like I pretty much um, with like SoFi, I applied their, their existing design system. So they have like all the like fonts, colors, everything um, mapped out. Whereas like with this app, um, I pretty much designed all of the elements myself. So I worked through that design system process. And then with the Google design challenge, I pretty much use Google material to kind of guide that um, UI portion. So there are a lot of like big companies that have like guidelines for UI that you can follow um, and kind of base your UI off of if you don't wanna spend all your time working on the visual design portion. And so this is um, an example of a prototype that's like, scrollable and you can kind of interact with it to see like how animations would happen or like how things might like expand to sh or collapse to show different um, kind of interactions with the product. Um, this was used when I was at SoFi to kind of present the final concept to a lot of stakeholders. And also we use this for user testing to check and see like if it made sense to people, if like interactions were intuitive. And so it might not be over multiple pages. It can very much be just like a one page scroll where you kind of like are trying to experience that specific page in its entirety. Because it's really different like looking at this animation versus like a very long screen that I paste onto my page to show you exactly what's happening. Um, this is a lot easier for people to visualize and understand. Um, and then this is kind of like a interactive prototype. I'll like just walk really quickly through it. Um, I'm gonna take a little while to load. Um, but yeah, this was the kind of travel planning app that I made in my class. Oh, wow, I should have preloaded this. Okay, anyway, um, so you can see that you can like do some horizontal scroll to see like the other content. You can scroll vertically and then click through to different aspects, like save, oh, add something to your plan. Um, as you can see, I don't really remember exactly how I was adding stuff and then look at specific interactions like adding a like place to your plan or liking it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, and then, so that's pretty much like the interactivity portion of the prototype um, as I was talking about. Great. And then, so I'll talk a little bit now about the different methodologies used for the design prototyping processes that I've experienced. Um, every company is a little different with what they use, but generally follow 
um, one of one of these two processes. Maybe they have some tweaks or like use a combination of the tool. I mean, the two processes, but I think generally like Agile and Lean are the two big methodologies that most tech companies use. So Agile is um, actually something that was established as like a developer workflow. Um, and it's generally used in the more established tech companies where a product has already been launched and a team is kind of working on refining it um, or expanding a feature set. So for example, um, when I worked at SoFi, the team worked with an agile framework um, and I was pretty much just working in design sprints um, and then handing off the work to dev devs after two weeks. Um, so sprints um, are basically two to three week long working sessions where each designer or developer um, builds and works towards specific goals. Um, so this can be multiple things, um, small things in like one feature where you're working on like, okay, how do I update this button? Like what is the um, interaction of like making a payment? Or it can be a set of features like, oh, I'm trying to update the, um, sorry, I'm trying I'm blanking on an actual example. Um, it could be like, oh, I'm trying to make this like search feature into a map functionality. Um, yeah, so it could kind of range from like a bunch of different things in the time frame. My, it might be split up into like separate little chunks to be workable. Um, and so design is always one full sprint ahead so that devs have something to build on when it comes time for their sprint. So you're really handing off their work and then they'll build it immediately. Other, if design wasn't one step ahead, then developers wouldn't really have something to work on if that makes sense. Um, and this kind of idea of agile was made to kind of syn yeah, sorry, synchronize these two divergent workflows um, for the kind of optimal product output. Um, and generally works towards one more polished product that teams are kind of iterating on to improve and constantly make better. Um, Lean is used more in startup environments or smaller companies um, without a necessarily established product. Um, so essentially what um, we're doing here is plugging in the UX design process into their existing build, measure, and learn cycle. So what designers would do is design something, test it, and then learn from the results and iterate for the next round of designs. The focus here is kind of understanding whether users find your product attractive and if there is a market for the idea and kind of validating whether your concept would be successful before putting in a ton of like time, money and effort into launching like a really high fidelity product that might just flop. Um, the idea here is to create a minimal, minimum viable product, which is an MVP um, that can be launched to all your users, real users, and then learn from users feedback and metrics. Um, and so I feel like I can't talk about prototyping without going into usability a little bit. Um, usability testing is super important in the prototyping process because you always wanna be consulting with your users or potential users. So you don't lose sight of the goal um, of creating a product that ultimately benefits your users. Um, there's a bunch of testing methods and I'm gonna split it up into kind of testing with a user versus testing with an expert. Um, and with users, it's pretty straightforward. Um, you or your company can recruit users of your product um, or from your defined potential user base. Um, and you kind of walk, um, set up some existing tests for them to go through, sorry, tasks for them to go through um, and evaluate the ways that they complete these tasks. Um, so as I said before, most usability tests um, generally involve this set of tasks. You have the user walk through the interface and you're basically testing the success rate of these tasks. Um, for moderated interviews, this involves you having a researcher or even a designer um, sitting down with the user and walking through their different tasks together. So it's generally used to get more qualitative in-depth information from users um, and really understand how they interact with or feel about an interface. Um, so they're given the set of tasks that they can complete and the moderator essentially asks a bunch of questions while the user's working through the tasks to kind of figure out how they're thinking, why they're thinking that way, or they can ask them to think aloud um, and kind of describe their process that they're having within their mind. Um, if your idea isn't as flushed out, you can still do an unmoderated test on like a low or like low to medium fidelity product. Um, but instead you just have the moderator do the walking through of the platform and kind of ask users like, what do you expect when you click this? Or like, what would you, what would you do to complete this task? Or like, what do you think makes more sense? So you're kind of understanding the user's mental model and like what would be intuitive for them. But generally moderated testing is the most expensive method um, since you do have to recruit participants in a real company and like pay them for their time. 
unmoderated testing is cheaper. Um, it can get to a wider range of users um, and there is a lot more quantitative data on success. So the metrics are a little bit different. You might look at like the amount of time it takes to complete a task or um, just like how many button clicks it takes to get to a certain place. Um, it's very similar to the unmoderated in the sense that like there's tasks, people walk through them, but you just complete these with um, the screens in like Envision or like some other prototyping app as a link. Um, and you would probably need it to be a little higher fidelity because um, at that point, they have to be able to complete the test without someone sitting next to them and explaining different components to them. So the user should be able to go through this test with just like a written set of instructions that you give them and not need that much clarification. Um, and generally, unmoderated testing is there to help you kind of validate your research hypotheses or kind of insights that you gain from moderated tests. Um, card sorting helps you to understand users' mental models and how they kind of perceive your features. Um, and it's used to kind of understand where you can place your features so it will be more intuitive for users. Um, navigation, especially, is somewhere where you see card sorting being used a lot, um, trying to figure out like, okay, where should I nest like, um, I guess, creating or editing my profile under account or something like that. Um, I'm actually working on a project for my school where we're creating this um, course picker so that you can kind of map out your classes depending on what specialization or major or career path you're interested in. Um, and that's where we're gonna do a lot of card sorting to figure out like, okay, what do people um, a certain course under? Like, is this like more theory-based or more like practice-based, um, that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally, guerrilla testing, it's basically where you kind of go into a public space, um, obviously in non-COVID times. So it could be your office with some non-designers or a cafe and ask people um, what they think about your ideas. And it's great for testing more lower fidelity sketches or just like initial ideas to get people's um, first reaction or response to a concept. Um, and then usability testing with experts. In this context, an expert could be another user designer or your manager maybe. Um, you can also hire like usability experts or consultants to come through to perform these tests. Um, if you're doing this in like a startup environment, I would just have another designer come through and like work on these with you um, because you definitely want it to be a third, uh, a second opinion or third opinion rather than your own so that people can kind of test or like walk through the app in a more objective manner so they're not like attached to the project. Um, so both are very straightforward. Um, you could probably get a good idea of usability just by having designers or researchers uh, walk through it since they're generally pretty aware of these methods. Um, these are also obviously good things um, to keep in mind while you're designing as well. So thinking through like the 10 heuristics that we're gonna talk about in the heuristic evaluation. Um, so the way that heuristic evaluation works is that um, I don't know if you guys know about Nielsen's 10 heuristics, but um, I could send you a link to that, but I don't wanna list all of them because there's a lot. Um, but essentially you're walking through the interface screen by screen um, and then checking that the interface is easy to learn, allows users enough freedom and the ability to go back and that it's intuitive and just generally follows UX best practices. Um, and you pretty much just assess it against the 10 heuristics that Nielsen has established. Um, in terms of the cognitive walkthrough, it's kind of similar to usability tests actually, where instead of a user, you're having an expert walk through the key tasks that a typical user would use um, your interface to complete and um, kind of assess how easy it is to complete these tasks and what areas could be improved or what could be clarified. Um, it's definitely more specific to the product itself and you can understand the overall flow of the interface and provide feedback on that as well. Um, I think my ideal expert testing would be like using both of these or something that's like um, both of them mixed together. So yeah, I think these methods are really helpful and like it can be used in any sort of design, honestly, like doesn't have to be UX design. I think this is pretty helpful for like product design or graphic design or anything where you're user facing. Um, and when should you test? Um, well, I think this timeline is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you should always try to test at every stage of your prototyping um, process as you can. Um, in an ideal world, this is what you would do, I guess. You would kind of do your user research, do some card sorting. Um, that's kind of like the best way to do that before going into the low fidelity. So you have an idea of like your information architecture and how you want that to be structured. Um, and then guerrilla testing right after you've made these low fidelity um, 
mock-ups while they're still kind of like sketchy um, and not quite established yet. Um, and then some moderated testing for like something that's in between so that you can have your researcher kind of sit down and talk to a user and kind of walk them through an app that they might be able, not be able to kind of interact with themselves. Um, and then between medium and high fidelity, I think this is the kind of ideal place to test um, if you don't have time to do it at all the different stages. Um, because then you haven't like put in all the effort to make things look pretty and like pixel perfect. Um, and you can kind of implement these changes while you're also making them pixel perfect. So it's kind of like two birds with one stone, like you're implementing the user feedback as well as polishing up the application. Um, so yeah, if you have limited resources at the very least, I would say test before the product launch and make the tweaks right before you launch. Um, and then also, right between medium and high fidelity. Um, and then finally, A-B testing is kind of like, I would say it's not really a form of usability testing. It's more of a way to compare different versions of a design. Um, so if you, so at SoFi we had um, this, not issue, but we were trying to figure out how to like reinvent the like buy, sell, trade button of like the investment platform. Um, and so one thing that we tried, we like couldn't really agree with the product managers on how that should look. And so um, we did an A-B test to figure out like what users found most intuitive. Um, and that's often a really good way to settle um, disagreements within the team. So if they're like two designers or like the design and the product team don't necessarily agree, um, seeing what the user thinks is like often the most objective like solution where you're not really biasing based on someone else's idea or your own idea of what you think the users will have, but rather like exactly what they would do. Um, so yeah, that's kind of one of the more important parts of testing for sure. Um, I actually finished a lot faster than I thought I would, but yeah, so that was my presentation. Um, and I would love to answer any questions you guys have. If there's anything I didn't clarify or you guys want more details on, I'm happy to talk through them as well. Yeah, if anyone has any questions, you can just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask, or you can ask in the chat. Oh yeah, thanks for sending the 10 heuristics, Cindy. I see that now. I feel like oh, I heard oh. someone unmute. <laughs> yes, I unmuted. Um, I'm Sanjana. Um, hey. So I was just wondering for user research, like I feel like in startups, there's not much time to do like that much in-depth research. So I was just wondering like how that fits into the whole design process. Um, yeah, for sure. So yeah, it is really hard. I think with startups, you have to like go that extra mile of like convincing them um, how it's valuable to have user research. Um, I would say just like, honestly, just like do it. Like even as people are, I don't know if you're coming from the point of like, oh, I'm working with like a designer or like I'm the designer slash researcher on the team. Um, maybe you can clarify that a little bit or is it like a general question? <laughs> yeah, it was just a general question, but I feel like probably doing both as a designer. But... Yeah, so I think like, a really easy way to do it is like maybe just talk to like two or three users like even if you can just talk to like a few users it's better than not talking to anyone at all um that shouldn't take too much time i think um and just like understanding what their needs are or if the startup has like existing data or like surveys or something like that that's something that's really helpful to look into as well um i think definitely like needing to sell research is like a pretty tough challenge especially if you're like new but um I think the important thing to like let your product partners or like the startup know is that at the end of the day, like figuring out what users need or like what will be what they would like to see in a product is going to lead to a more successful like launch than having a product where you're kind of like blindly figuring out what the user wants and you don't necessarily know or have validated that. Um, 
I would actually use a like data approach because people love data um, and just being like, yeah, it's really important to have that data to back our decisions and like business decisions. And if we're just doing it off of like what we think is good rather than what the users actually need, um, you're probably not gonna address the need of whatever product you're creating. So yeah, definitely like I would say it's hard, it's definitely hard, but less research is better than no research. So um, I would definitely try to talk to users, look at some competitive analysis where you like look at other products and what they've done to get a better idea of it. And yeah, kind of go that route. Thank you. Um, I have one more question, but if someone else has another question, you can go ahead. <laughs> Okay, um, for the competitive analysis, I'm like working on, on something for fun, but mm -hmm. I've, I've run into this problem where it's just like, I don't know when to stop. <laughs> They're just so <laughs> yeah, no, I, I totally get that. Um, I would say like probably five to six products is more than enough. Um, focus on like the kind of biggest players. Um, I would say like maybe do three to four of like the biggest players and like the P the ones who are like most successful right now and like figure out why and what they have that's like making them so great and why people are drawn to them. And then maybe look at some like smaller players that are like newer to the market, but like have a clear distinction of like why, um, why are people using them? Um, so for example, I actually worked on a competitive analysis for one of my class projects and we were doing like our prompt was like how to reinvent like video calling pretty much. And so obviously there's like 50,000 apps out there that like deal with video calling, like Teams, like Skype, whatever, Zoom. Um, and so we tried to keep it to like five or four of the big competitors. And then we looked at some like smaller um, apps that like, like Marco Polo, I think is like a newer one. Um, and then just like a bunch of more like niche indie apps that had like specific factors that tried to differentiate themselves from the big players in the market. Um, yeah, so that really helps. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question um, about kind of working alongside UX design and also with developers. Mm -hmm. um, do you ever think that um, it's a good idea to give developers all the information that you learn in UX research? Or do you think that's kind of like a waste of their time? What, what do you think is like, is there a good balance between both? Yeah, um, I definitely think there's a balance. Um, I wouldn't give, um, the only people that I would say you could maybe give all your information to is like designers, but I think product and developer partners generally have less time and like probably won't look through all of it. Um, I think the most important stuff to give them is like the high level of like, okay, this is exactly what I would recommend, like give them kind of like recommendations and maybe provide a little bit of evidence like numbers. So like solid, like 50% of our users thought this or like 80% of our users felt like this was not strong enough. Um, people really latch onto the numbers in I think tech, especially like if you're a developer or <clears throat> product background because of that like business mindset. Um, so yeah, I would definitely, keep that to like a high level. And if they do want to hear more about like specifics, then like have them follow up and like schedule something and then you can like give them more information. But yeah, that would be a great place to start. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Yeah. <laughs> um, so as like a designer, if you're like working in a startup or something, um, how important is it to know like product strategy and like all like the business metrics and like, mm -hmm. I, I feel like it's just hard to advocate for the user without knowing all that. Yeah, that's um, very important actually. So I think that it's important to know a lot about like what their key metrics for success are and like understand what they see as like this is what shows that our product is being used or like our product is doing well and kind of try to work through designs not exactly based on that but like try to implement your designs or like find designs solutions to ways that might increase 
like whatever metric it is that they find important, if that makes sense. Um, I would, I guess in, I've worked with, I've only worked with one startup. So, and like the one it's what I'm currently working at and they aren't super big on like needing me to know about metrics. So that's not really an area I'm super familiar with, to be honest, but um, I would say just like trying to tailor your designs or like prioritizing things that will also benefit the users, but kind of help their metrics to go up and we'll show that very clearly, I think is a good starting point because then you can kind of balance your um, priorities and just be like, okay, look, like we really listen to our users and it also caused your metrics to like do better. Um, and so that kind of gives you a better footing to begin with. And then later on, you can maybe prioritize your user needs over the metrics less. I mean, metrics more um if that makes sense at all yeah that makes sense thank you yeah yeah sorry metrics aren't my strong suit either and I'm trying to like learn more about them when I start working but um it was something my supervisor said like it's a lot more important the later on you are in your career actually um especially if you're considering going towards like management or um if you want to switch from design into product management yeah product management um and showing that you're aware of those metrics and like business kind of priorities is really important. Also happy to answer any questions about like job search or like, I don't know, do people care about like salary and like that kind of stuff. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more about salary and job search? Uh, yeah, like what areas specifically, I guess, did you want to hear about? I guess in either UX or UI design, if you know about that. Yeah, so I would say, <clears throat> um, first of all, like UX, UI is kind of like combined now. So um, you would typically be working on both as a UX designer, unless you're like explicitly a visual designer. Um, in that case, you would maybe be working more on like the design system side of things. So like helping to tweak the like overall like fonts, colors, that kind of stuff on um, a specific like platform. Um, Cause that's all like unified and most companies have like components that you kind of like drag and drop and like just put into screens to create them. Um, so you're not really doing a ton on the like visual design side of things um, if you're like a UX UI designer, but yeah. So that's the first thing. And then um, did you say you wanted to know about uh, job applications or like applying for jobs and stuff? I guess like if you're allowed to talk about salary and like what that looks like in terms of searching for jobs. Yeah, um, definitely. I can send you guys a link actually that I use to, and it's like pretty accurate from what I know, um, but it basically shows you like the different levels of salaries as you go up through um, designing. But so I think for UX designers, when you go in, this is also like product designers, like UX, UI, interaction designers, it's called different things at different companies. Um, I think when you're starting out from finishing undergrad, it is probably something, the base is something around between 110 and 120K, I think is about average. Um, I'm not 100% sure on that. That's my ballpark because I only know the figures for like being a master's student. Um, but I think that's only one level up. So that sounds like about the right like range. Um, if you have a master's degree, I think the starting range would be between 120 and 130 slash 135. Um, and so that's 
because you have the extra degree. So they count that as like an additional two years of experience essentially. So yeah, that's your base. And then you also get a bonus depending on the kind of company you work for, you can either get RSUs, which are restricted stock units. Um, and that's like, oh, I like have a hard time explaining this, but essentially it's like your investment in your company, I guess. You should probably look this up like for what it exactly is because I'm not super clear on it, but essentially you have like um, a certain percentage or like number of these units and they are valued at, um, based on how your company's doing essentially. Um, and so, that's really nice. Um, that's like an additional bonus almost. Um, for public companies, I think you just get, you get investment options, I think. <laughs> so yeah, it's a little bit different depending on like if your company's public or private, but um, that's pretty much the gist of it. Does that help? Yes, thank you. Yeah, of course. I know like, salary is super taboo with a lot of people, especially within like the design world. So want to open that conversation up for sure. I have another question. Yeah, um, that's okay. So I feel like a lot is going to change within like design in like the next 10 years or so. So I was just wondering like, do you, if you have ever felt overwhelmed by like having to learn and like keep on top of all these like new design softwares and how you manage that? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think in terms of software, um, I think they've been pretty similar to one another. So I think jumping across like Figma and Sketch, for example, wasn't really challenging. And I think XD is pretty similar. So in that sense, I don't think those will be changing too much. So rest assured on that. Um, I think at the end of the day, like what's most important is like as a designer, you have like an established process and you know um, kind of what the steps are to take whenever you like land in a new role um, so that you have like your established like process and you can kind of fit that into whatever framework your existing company uses. Um, because I think designing is like a very personal thing. Um, I think a lot of people would say that, but it's just like, whatever works best for you. I don't think you necessarily have to listen to like every Medium article that you read. Like, for example, a lot of people think that um, personas are a huge part of like designing and like part of the ideation process. I personally find it like pretty garbage. Um, and like, for me, it's just useful to know that like, okay, these are my user groups and these are the people that I should be designing for. I don't need like a whole profile that like tells me if they're an ENFJ or something. Um, so very much just like use the methods that like you think are useful and like help you keep that idea of like designing for a user in your mind um, and go from there. Um, yeah, I guess I haven't felt incredibly overwhelmed because like, I feel like I've been learning like more slowly than most people have because I have like that grad school experience. Um, but I think that like design is going to be relevant for a very long time. And like, I don't think that's gonna change anytime soon. So definitely don't worry about that. Um, but yeah, it's a great field to be in. Um, there are definitely a lot of places like specifications or like areas that you can explore like accessibility design or like usability. Um, but yeah, I would just say, take it at your own pace, like whatever works best for you and what you think um, you're passionate about or like makes you feel good about designing um, and you feel like supplements your skills for the user. Other than that, like I wouldn't be too worried about like trying to learn everything in the book on design because everyone's always gonna be like a little bit different. Some people are gonna be more research oriented. Some people are gonna be more visually inclined. Um, and that's very much just like what you choose to be. Um, what your focus is on. That was very sharing. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I hope that helped. Oh, I saw another question in chat. Um, average career trajectory. Um, is that like salary wise? Or are you curious about like what positions you could go into, I guess? Um, to whoever asked that question, I think your name. Okay, positions. Um, yeah, so there are a few tracks. So the most 
straightforward one where it's like just upwards is like you are so you start off as an individual contributor as a designer and you kind of stay in the individual contributor track and you just become like more and more of an expert in your field um so this is like a relatively new concept in tech i think um more and more people are being encouraged to go through that route because people used to think that it was either you like become a manager or you're just like stuck in your designer position you don't like get better um but people are realizing that like a that creates shitty managers from people who like don't necessarily want to manage or like know how to manage properly and like go into it just because they want to feel like they're um advancing and b because like having someone who has like all that expertise and knowledge of from all those years of like working and like learning in the field is so valuable like there was a guy on my team at sofi who was like i think he's like 18 years or something into UX and he just like he was amazing like I feel like we would just go to him for like the most random things and like he had so much wisdom um and it was really great so I see contributor individual contributor is one route um the other route is obviously going to a design management position um that is like I think if you're interested in managing people you like that aspect um really great for you to go into but it does mean that you're going to be a lot more hands off and you won't be designing very much anymore um and so that's a trade off that like people have to be okay with um and i know that designers have a hard time with like going into that management role because they're like oh it's like so hard to not like be in the weeds and like really like work on the design i think like i talked to my manager um for my team and she said like one of the hardest parts was just like not being able to like i guess you're not really exerting your vision onto a design anymore you're kind of like trying to facilitate other designers to design something good. Um and then there is also the product management route. Uh sorry. Well, my cat is doing some crazy things. Um so there's the product management route where um you can become a product manager. I think that's um pretty common now um because design is still pretty new and so it's still typically engineers going into PM roles. Um but it's very much something that designers should aspire towards because we do have a very good understanding of the like user priorities as well as the business priorities because that's something we kind of have to juggle every day so i think the skills are pretty transferable but it does require you having to think a little bit more on the business side and like lower your priority for the user needs um and that is something that i know that a lot of designers find um difficult and like me personally like i thought i wanted to go into pm but after like and turning into summer i was like i am so bad at this metric stuff like maybe it's something i can learn but right now it's not really something i'm super interested in so yeah that's another thing to consider like whether or not business priorities is something that like really calls out to you or like you're really just here to design something that's great for users so i hope that was helpful I think we have time for one or two more questions. So yeah, definitely ask away. <laughs> I'm just gonna go ahead and ask. Um, <laughs> so I'm like pretty passionate about like healthcare. Um, so I know there's like medical human factors and then there's like design. So I was just wondering if you have any experience working with people from like the human factor side and whether that like overlaps with UI UX. Um truthfully I haven't. So I'm sorry I can't answer that better, but um there is a lot of like healthcare in tech right now. So um I'm yeah, actually I'm working for a startup that like helps on the nursing side of things and like matching them to hospitals and staffing and stuff. Um, so it definitely is a very big problem space that like a lot of people are looking to address. So, um, yeah. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, I have a question about grad school. Um, so, how did you 
choose between uh, just going straight into in- industry and then just like continuing to work and mm-hmm. then um, going to grad school and learning more. And is that something that's usually common in design careers? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, I wanted to go into grad school for two reasons. The first one was that I feel like I didn't have a huge foundation in like the kind of understanding of users and like the more user research side of things um, because I did major in architecture and like I didn't have the cognitive science background or like understanding of that. So that was something that I wanted to get. Um, The other reason was that it's typically, unless you've done, so I didn't figure out that I wanted to switch to UX until like my junior summer. Um, So I didn't have that much time to like work um, at companies or like with startups my senior year at all. Um, And so I wasn't able to get that professional experience that would have given me like the ability to get a job essentially. Um, So it was kind of out of necessity in a lot of ways. Um, And also I am an international student. So that was like something that I had to consider because um, uh, because of my visa and I wasn't able to like work in a field that wasn't architecture post-grad. But yeah, I would say like grad school is really helpful if you feel like you need the time and you have the resources to kind of Um, spend your time learning about something um, and have that additional summer to like intern which will obviously give you better chances at a job Um, but if you like have startup experience now you've like worked with some companies I would very much recommend like go straight into the field because it's if you're able to that is like if that's something um, that you're like you feel like you're ready to apply um, all that stuff it's like very much the way to go because you learn so much from like working I think I learned more in my entire summer in like three months in the summer than like my first year of my master's program so it's very telling um but yeah thank you yeah that's very helpful yeah I also think if you're like incredibly passionate about like one area of like research or design or like you want more experience learning about like for example accessibility or like um really drilling down into like the user behavior side of things and understanding like what is the best way to like interview or like survey people um it's definitely worth going to grad school for because that's where you'll get that really in-depth knowledge um but a lot of most of the things that you'll need um skill set wise i think you'll pretty much learn on the job I think we have time for one more question, if anyone has anything. Yeah, sorry, I thought my four pages of content would be enough for like 40 minutes, but I was wrong. I guess I speak faster than I remember. Um, I have a question about like the future of like design. So um, what are like some tech trends that you think are going to be like really big in the future and that like designers should jump on? Ooh, that's a fun one. Um, definitely think that like AI and machine learning is going to be really big. And like, I personally think that like we need designers in that space now, because as with a lot of things, like it's initially developed by just programmers and engineers. Um, And obviously that's not a bad thing, but I think it's always helpful to have that like UX perspective in there to like figure out like, okay, how can we like really make this useful for users? And like, what do users really want out of this? Um, Aside from that, like specific areas, I really do think that like healthcare is gonna take off because there's so many inefficiencies with that right now. Like a lot of traditional industries that are like very core to our being humans and like what people really like need to do like healthcare like the government agencies and like how tax forms for example are done like all of that is so out of date and like very like 1990s interfaces um so healthcare is i think a huge place that is going to be like blowing up soon um because there's like so much complexity Um, but it needs to be easily explained to users. And it's something that like a lot of people feel like they have barriers of entry to understanding. Um, And I think UX is the way that we're gonna be able to make that more accessible to everyone um, and beneficial. So these are my thoughts. 
Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay. Thank you so much, Mitney, for being here with us today. Yeah. Thank you guys for having us, uh, having me, sorry. I'm so glad that y'all um, came and attended and I hope you found that useful. And obviously feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions or like um, concerns or more questions about like salary or whatever. <laughs> I'm happy to help anytime. Cool, thank you. Yeah, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.